Well, thanks a lot. Uh, I hope you're still awake for the last talk. I already changed the title slightly. As you will see in the program, I, I remain a bit vague. Right? I just talked about trust, trustworthiness, and knowledge in a digital age. And, uh, and now I you know, specified a little bit more. I'll tell you a bit about why I did this. Uh, so this is the outline of my talk. I'm just going to give you a very short introduction about why I chose to zoom in on that topic uh, and then talk briefly about the notions which have come up quite frequently today, trust and trustworthiness from you know, philosophical perspective, and then give a bit of an introduction into artificial intelligence and big data. It's in brackets because you can't nowadays talk really very much about AI if you don't talk about the data as well. Um, and then I will actually, instead of you know, drawing some conclusions, I will end with lots of questions in regards to whether or not we can actually talk about um, trusting AI or trustworthy AI, and I'll hopefully um, have made some way until then. So when I prepared um, for this talk, I actually looked back first, and this was uh, to the last time I was in Dublin, which was 2017 for the uh, Truth, Trust, and Expertise workshop, and at the time I was talking about trust and big data. The reason being that these are my two favorite topics, trust on the one hand side and big data being the others, and I tried to link them. The paper that was supposed to come out of that is still not published, right? But then I realized that nowadays everybody who talked about big data in the recent years is now talking about AI. So that's point one. The second point is, interestingly, the notion of trust and trustworthiness looms really large in all the public policy documents on AI. So this is um, the ethics guidelines. There has been a high-level expert group. We learned about expert advice. Uh, so this was one on the European Commission side, advising the Commission on the development of artificial intelligence. And they called it building trust in a human-centric AI, ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI, right? So you have a twofold in there. And then just, um, just last week, actually, the white paper on artificial intelligence by the new European Commission came out. And this is entitled, A European Approach to Excellent and Trust. And that struck me as, as quite interesting to see that the notions of trust and trustworthiness loom so large in these debates on AI, um, as they do. So before I go into AI, I'll talk a little bit about trust and trustworthiness before I link the two topics at the very end. <clears throat> so there are lots of, for the philosophers in the room, lots of philosophical questions in regards to what trust is and what trustworthiness is. So first, is trust an emotion? Is it an attitude? Is it a cognitive stance? Do I make some calculation on when to trust? Does it differ from merely relying on something? And what is this difference between trust and reliance? Um, whom can we trust? Can we trust into technologies? Or can we only trust human beings? Can we trust collectives? Um, whom should we trust, right? Irrespective of whether we can trust, the question is where should we place trust? This is sort of like the normative uh, angle point in that regard. And when are we justified in trusting and how do we know whether and when we are being justified in trusting? Uh, what is trustworthiness as a countering uh, concept in these domains? What is the relationship between trust and trust normative, uh, trust and trustworthiness both descriptively and normatively? And thus, do both trust and trustworthiness, and I will argue they will, uh, entail both epistemic and moral components? And uh, of course, I'm not going to answer to all of those, but I have a brief advertisement in there, but it's going to be only a second. So if you're interested, this book is coming out. You can't see it, but it's a Routledge handbook on trust and philosophy and will be out in May. So if you want to zoom in more deeply, this is uh, hopefully the place to go. I just want to give you a short primer on some of these questions by just you know, mentioning three works which I find rather seminal. Um, one is by John Hardwick, which is a very early paper on the role of trust in science. And since we talked a lot about science and expertise today, I think this is a rather fitting uh, context to talk about trust. What he does in this, um, in this paper is saying like, well, you know, we rely a lot, science is supposed to rely on evidence and not on trust, but this is actually, if you look into this, it's not really an adequate description of how science work because we really rely on other people's expertise and, and uh, what he's arguing is say that due to specialization and time pressure, modern knowers cannot be independent and self-reliant, not even within their own field of specialization, right? They have to rely on, their, on others, on their colleagues. And this both, on their competency, right, that they know what they are doing, on their honesty, that they don't, you know, fabricating results or something like this, but also, and we heard this in the recent talks, on the adequate epistemic self-assessment, which basically means a second order epistemic knowledge that you know the limits of what you're not knowing. This is something you just mentioned before that some experts are asking other domains in which they are not actually experts. 
So this basically means that, that you know, trustworthiness uh, that is necessary for science to work has an epistemic and a moral component. There's a knowledge component and it has a moral component with regards to honesty. The second seminal book, I think, is Stephen Shapin's a social, social History of Truth, which you know, is rather a social history account of the role of gentlemen's testimony in the development of English experimental philosophy as a predecessor of experimental science in England in the 17th century. And what he's basically uh, saying first, also a quote, knowledge is a collective good. In securing our knowledge, we rely upon others, and we cannot dispense with that reliance. That means that the relations in which we have and hold our knowledge have a moral character, and the world are used to indicate this moral relation is trust. So here again, um, and what he's actually analyzing here is saying, well, in, in the early stages of experimental research, you had to have some witnesses who were re reporting on what was, what was the result of an outcome. of, And, and um, the, the, um, the, the gentlemen were considered trustworthy witnesses because they were independent, because they were financially independent. Thus, they could not be influenced to say something other than they were witnessing. This was the assumption. I'm not saying that this is truthful, right? But the idea was, if you're economically, economically dependent upon somebody, you can't be be trustworthy because you may be induced for monetary reasons to say other than you have observed. So the economic, um, basically, independence was seen as, a, um, as, a, as an indicator of the epistemic quality of what you're saying, but also of your moral quality of being honest or being able to be honest. So it was actually the assumed disinterestedness of gentlemen, which was used as a proxy for the trustworthiness of their testimony. And what he's also referring to is about the relational nature of trust, because there is a community of gentlemen bound by the word of each other, knowing each other, and this would sort of increase the likelihood of being trustworthy in what you're reporting. Unfortunately, um, you can make two errors when you're trusting, right? On the one hand, you can and call them basically, if you want, from, from experimental research, the alpha and the beta error. What you can do is you can trust those who aren't trustworthy. Right? This is one misfit, if you want. And the other is you can distrust, distrust those who would have been trustworthy. Both are epistemic and moral flaws. Right? Because on the one hand side, you, you learn something which is actually wrong, or you may not learn something which you could have learned, but you haven't learned because you distrust it, and the other way around. I hope this is, this is clear, that these are the two possible errors that you can make in trusting. Of course, in science, we don't only trust other people, but we also trust, trust, uh, trust very crucially, and we're moving towards AI instruments and technologies. And I want to, very, it's very difficult to see, uh, but this is a book by, by Paul Humphreys, Extending Ourselves, Computational Science, Empiricism, and the Scientific Method. And he's analyzing basically, um, well, his argument is as follows. Scientific knowledge is not limited, as you all know, to human senses. Right? We are using instruments and new forms of mathematics, such as uh, simulations. And many calculations, not only in physics, but he was focusing a lot on physics, are too complex to be conducted by humans alone. They depend upon computers. And that leads in many fields, and that will get, I'll get back to that in the case of AI, to the problem what he calls epistemic opacity. Right? When, it, when a computing process is too fast for humans to follow in detail, or when there is no explicit algorithm linking inputs to outputs. So, and the question that he raises there, and I think it's a crucial one that we now have to address in regards to AI, is where do we have to start trusting in the use of simulations and other complex mathematical models? Okay. So, I want to summarize this first, uh, this first part, and it would be to say <coughs> knowledge and trust are deeply interlinked both in research but also in everyday life. Most of our knowledge depends in some forum on, the, on trust in other people's testimonies, testimony, but we do not only trust people, but increasingly also institutions, procedures, technologies, we had a lot of our trust in experts before. But our practices of trusting are fallible. You know, this is the core of trust. It's not certainty. There's a vulnerability in trusting, and it makes you vulnerable to misplacing your trust, right? So keep this in mind now that we move to AI and big data. So, um, as I said, this, this, uh, the debates on artificial intelligence, this, this has been a boom topic in the last years, right? And I spent the last two years probably advising, being on a lot of government committees on AI in, in the last two years. So just to get the record about what we're talking about, this is the definition taken from this high-level expert group of the European Commission. I was not part of that, just, uh, I was just part of the German uh, Commission on that. 
Artificial intelligence systems are software and possibly also hardware systems designed by humans that, given a complex goal, act in the physical or digital dimension by perceiving the environment through data acquisition, interpreting the collected structured or unstructured data, reasoning on the knowledge, or processing the information derived from this data and deciding the best action to take to achieve the given goal. AI systems can either use symbolic rules or learn numer a numerical model, and they can also adapt their behavior by analyzing how the environment is affected by their previous actions. So I'm not going to go into the details, but what, what should be obvious already, this is taking over a lot of what we could have, you know, this is using a lot of epistemic notions about reasoning, about you know, processing data, but also very practical oriented. It's about taking decisions to achieve a certain goal, right? And this links us quite strongly, I think, both to the epistemic discuss uh, dimensions discussed today and to the policy advice uh, debate, because a lot of policy device, uh, advice is currently um, being thought of as being uh, big data driven, and we'll have to investigate what, what this means on the long run. A second definition, um, just because you know, whenever we talk about uh, AI, you also need to mention at least briefly singularity, so I want to talk, tell you what I'm not talking about today. So this is another definition from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. AI here is characterized as a subfield of computer science devoted to developing programs that enable computers to display behavior that can broadly be characterized as intelligent. Most research in AI is devoted to fairly narrow applications such as planning or speech-to-speech -speech translation in limited limited, well-defined task domains, but substantial interest remains in the long-range goal, long goal of building generally intelligent autonomous agents, even if the goal of fully human-like intelligence is elusive and seldom pursued explicitly as such. So this is basically the distinction which you will always find and often find in literature between strong AI, which is very much focusing on the idea of autonomous agents whose general intelligence, so not just speech, but everything we broadly characterize as intelligent behavior, equals or even surpasses human intelligence. This is a lot of, of debate about you know, singularity and all these. You know, I think there's a lot of hype and hope around this. Uh, I'm not particularly interested. It is philosophically interesting, but not, but not for me. Right? What I'm more interested in is, is so-called weak AI, which are these increasingly also sophisticated technological solutions for very well-defined specific cognitive tasks, such as machine translation, computer vision, expert systems. So they, they, they do something very specific, right? It has nothing to do with all these uh, mundane things of you know, uh, simulating human intelligence, but, but doing something very specific. And machine learning in particular is basically the, the category of, of, let's say, statistical analysis, if you wish, um, that, that is underlying the majority of what is currently being debated under the heading of AI. Um, and you will probably have in the news, you know, this is already a bit older, about all these advances in, in AI. So, you know, Google's machine wins the Go match. You probably recall this. There's a lot of debate also uh, about expert systems such as IBM Watson. So, and if you look into the, you know, this is, you know, if you go all the way in philosophy, of, often, of course, to Leibniz, if you want to talk about, uh, about AI. But if you, if you look into the history of artificial intelligence, there have been lots of ups and downs, right? It's often been a winter of AI and a summer of AI, and there's been lots of phases in which there was a lot of hope about, you know, next breakthroughs coming, and then there was a lot of, uh, of sort of like... Um, um, recognition that this is not working as planned, right? But in recent years, and I'm not going to go through all the de details, but usually Alan Turing is considered to be sort of like the marking stone when, when the history of AI is starting and everything before is the, the prehistory of, of AI, if you wish. Um, but what is happening right now, we're, we're again up very much on a high like inflated expectations about what AI is doing. And I think part of the reason this is the case, and this is why I'm linking this back now to the debates about big data, is because we now have an abundance of data on many topics, and this is used through statistical means, mostly through deep learning, but also other types of, of, of statistical analysis. And this has led to so sort of like recent advantage, uh, advances both in, in all these matters which you can find on the news, right? So, but this is what I'm, what I'm talking about. So let's briefly talk into big data, and then I'll come to the problem exposition of where the, where the issues may be. So usually when people talk about big data, they say it's not only that we have massive data, but these data is characterized through a number of different um, characteristics. So volume, the sheer mass of data, is only one, right? The other is velocity. It basically means there's a lot of speed in the acquisition and the processing basically sometimes in real time making predictions, something like this. So, so, so speed is an asset as well. 
It's about variety of data that you don't have only, let's say, one singular data point or something very precise, but maybe think about social media data or very different types of data. And there's also something about veracity that it's not only highly controlled databases in which everything is cleaned and secured, but you use all types of data in your processing. And this sort of like, this captures, and there's, there are other definitions with more Vs or less Vs, but this gives you a bit of an idea about what, you know, how also in, also in industry and in many dis discourses big data is grasped. Another view, let's say, on, on big data uh, by, by more social science um, people is from Dana Boyd and Kate Crawford, and they define big data as what they call a cultural, technological, and scholarly phenomenon that rests on the interplay of three things. First, technology. They are basically talking about that there has been uh, a maximization of computation power and algorithmic accuracy to gather, analyze, link, and compare large data sets, leading to this rise in big data, big data that we are witnessing. The second is analysis, drawing on large data sets to identify patterns in order to make economic, social, technical, and legal claims. And what you can see here, we're already leaving the realm of the, of the merely technical or mathematical, right? Because we are, we are aiming to make claims about other domains. Mm -hmm. And the third is what they call mythology, and that's something as an epistemologist I, I like in particular. Uh, the widespread belief that large data sets offer a higher form of intelligence and knowledge that can generate insights that were previously impossible with the aura of truth, objectivity, and accuracy, right? And this is something we will zoom in a little bit in, in what comes. Another way to look at it is, is to think about what data are we talking about when we're talking about the, the emergence of this massive amounts of data, right? And the first thing that people may think of, if you, if you look at that picture, is, you know, there is a shady woman doing something online, right? I mean, basically checking websites, clicking, browsing something, and while she's doing that, she's being classified as being female, as being married, as being a non-smoker, etc. So this is what people, you know, it's a visualization of profiling of you, as you wish, right? If you're doing things um, and you're being classified. Mm -hmm. Think about all the data you leave with your mobile phones. If I just know where your mobile phone is at what point of time, I know a hell of a lot of you, right? I know where you live, I know where you work, I know how you move from place to place. I know about your hobbies, right? Just by knowing where exactly your, your mobile phone is at what point of time. Transaction data, what are you buying? Where are you buying? How are you paying, et cetera? Um, then think about IoT sensors, all the you know, other types of data that are being gathered. On the right-hand side, you see some pictures. You can hardly see it, so I'm explaining it uh, about you know, data that is being gathered in the public domain, in the health domain, in the energy sector, transportation, all these data traces that are being, being gathered. Uh, if you think of medicine, you know, just think about, um, I recently, th that could be a, a talk of itself, I recently have a smartwatch, right? So if you have, if you have a tracker, um, this, this leaves lots of data traces as well. And also, of course, the government has lots of data um, that they may or may not use. So the interesting thing about big data is, of course, not that this exists, right? but that you can do some analytics and that you can basically process these types of data in order to do something with it, right? And let me just give you an idea about what people may want to do with these types of data. I mean, first, of course, is advertisement, right? I mean, this is a big, big market. Basically, mo most of the things we're doing online for free, um, basically, the, the background monetization is through advertisement. Um, but people also use data analytics to, in that case, uh, assist pathologists to detect cancer, cancer with deep learning. So, you know, deep learning is particularly good in, in pattern recognition and sort of like distinguishing between different types of, of, uh, of patterns. So if you want to distinguish healthy um, uh, tissues from cancer tissues, this may be useful, right? It's used for credit scoring. Um, whether or not you receive a credit um, may receive on a larger amount of data. There are actually certain companies which uh, ask you to provide them access to your online um, behavior so that they can give you a credit or not. Um, predictive policing, redlining of certain areas or sending police to certain areas is increasingly being data-driven. Um, we already talked about, in, in uh, Jose's talk, about um, content moderation, basically, and there has been uh, this is uh, Alexander Nix from Cambridge Analytica. There has been lots of debates, of course, about the effect of, uh, on, on, on voter turnouts and, and, and voter decision and Brexit uh, decision and also in the US. Um, on the right-hand side, this is meant to show that also, of course, the content that you're seeing online is being uh, algorithmic, uh, algorithmically filtered. And there has been debates about whether, you know, to what extent this may have 
uh, added to polarization because it shows people um, what they want to see depending on what are their political preferences. So this is supposed to show like a, a blue and a red news feed on certain topics. So if you are classified as more liberal, you may see something different uh, if you type in Mexico than if, you t uh, if, you're, if you're more conservative, something like this. Um, one example that I may be coming back to more frequently is uh, this has been an article by uh, Publica. What they did is they analyzed the software used um, uh, to predict uh, recidivism scores, basically to see whether people who have been uh, uh, charged cr with criminal offenses, whether they would be likely to, um, you know, uh, con to, to um, basically be be criminal again, if you wish, if you basically, if you, if you, yeah, if, if you've been, the chances of you committing another crime, sorry, let's put it more straightforward. And what they what they showed is basically that this software which is being used was heavily biased against um, um, Afro-Americans. Um, and the problem with this software, if you want to look into the details, is also that this is not straightforwardly uh, obvious because the software being used uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, also in the courtrooms, right? Because this is used for for settling bail or for settling probation issues, right? Uh, it's a proprietary software, which basically means due to trade secrets, you can't even see the algorithms, the database, you can't check the methods, and so they had to do this basically through a form of reverse engineering, looking at the outcomes and then trying to infer the workings of this software, okay? So just to give you an idea about, you know, the type of tools in which AI or at least database decision making is taking place. So if you think about, you know, um, all these types of data, keep them in mind before being processed for various purposes, you don't really know what purpose all these data traces that you're leaving are going to be used, right? You have no clue of assessing whether or not what you're checking online today will have an effect on whether or not you get credit in 10 years time, right? So what is, the problem is that there are some differentiations which we are very used to and which also the law is very used to, which become increasingly obsolete in the age of big data. And one is the one between what is considered sensitive information and innocent or innocuous data. Um, a very old case, but you know, it's still one of the easiest cases to make this claim, has been uh, this target case from 2012. You probably all know this, or at least many people have come across this, or maybe it's already too old. Um, but this was in the news in 2012. And basically, the story goes that a father called a Target or a sales representative or a customer service person from Target to complain about brochures about pregnancy-related products, which they received in their mail, like coupons. Um, and then um, it turned out afterwards the, the customer service person calls back, and the father was then very quiet on the phone and said there has been a miscommunication in the family. The 16-year-old daughter was indeed pregnant. The parents didn't know that. But obviously, Target knew it in advance. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you may wonder, like, what, what is the issue here, right? And the problem is, of course, that your consumption, your patterns of consumption, like what you're consuming compared to what other people are consuming can be highly predictive, right? If, you, if you're taking folic acid or buying body scent, body, uh, body lotion or other types of issues, in itself it may be innocent in combination with other types of data. It can be highly predictive of highly sensitive issues, right? So basically things that you don't think of being sensitive can become sensitive if they are processed in a certain way, if they are used for a specific purpose. The second differentiation that is becoming obsolete is between person-related and statistically profiled data because you will hear very often that data is being anonymous or anonymized or pseudonymized. Um, the problem is, to give you a very easy example, I used to get, uh, I, there were, I lived in Austria for a while and I had a grant there um, from the Austrian funding agency and they asked me for a questionnaire uh, how, how happy I was with their service, and I was, right? And I had to give a few um, indicators, demographic data about myself, um, my, my sex, my age, the discipline, the funding period, right? And I'm pretty sure that these four data points identify me in Austria, right? So the more data points you have on somebody, the higher the likelihood that you can re-identify somebody even if the person is not named. Right. And this is what is happening in this big data context. If you have lots of data about a person, even if it's not tied to you as a person, you can re-identify you through the aggregation of this data. Um, the next problem is that um, privacy infringements and discrimination can occur on group levels without the need for being identified. Right? If you are not getting credit because you live in a certain region or because you are a data, because you are basically a compound of data points, if you wish. It doesn't matter whether you are identified. You are part of a group and you are discriminated against as part of that group, right? 
So um, to, let me summarize. Um, if, if you if you look into these examples, and these are just you know sort of like an exception, uh, sort of like a, a, a selection, AI and database systems are used for automated or quasi-automated or just for a support of decision making in many domains. Sometimes it's really automated, the process goes through, and sometimes it's just support mechanism, right? If you think about a hiring mechanism and some, some people may be, may be selected for an interview, then those who are not selected, they may be automatically sorted out, right? For those who are invited, this may have been just a support. So the, the, there's a gray area between whether systems are automatically deciding or whether they're just supporting decision making. Anyway, but many, in many domains, we have these types of systems um, happening. Prevalent problems, which you may have recognized just from the very few examples which I gave, include at least the following, right? Issues of privacy, uh, that seems to be very obvious from what we had before. Issues of autonomy, at least the, the Cambridge Analytica case and the question of whether you can manipulate um, people through content um, uh, selection. It's, it's debated, right? But at least we can leave it open as a question whether or not autonomy is affected by, the, by what you're being chosen. Certainly autonomy is affected if you're sorted out in certain processes, right? Um, there's a huge debate about bias, discrimination, and fairness, uh, because as we have seen from this, uh, from this recidivism prediction software, um, this was heavily biased, heavily discriminating um, 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 Afro-Americans. There, there are tons of examples of software, um, be it facial recognition software, be it other types of software, which has certain biases. And I could dwell for about half an hour about what the sources of these are. These are not necessarily intended, but they are partly resulting from the training data. They are partly resulting from the methods you have in, in sort of like uh, in processing the data. The problem is you you. you I'll, the problem is you can't really get rid of all sorts of discrimination, right? You can possibly check for discrimination between men and women. You can check for discrimination between religions. You can check, with, but you need to check it in each data set, right? And you, maybe you can't make sure that it's not discriminated on all fronts. At least we have, you know, we have some legal guarantees with, that we're not discriminated against. But you know, complying to all of them at the same time may not be feasible, right? And if you don't only want to sort of like show that your software is not only discriminating, but it's also fair, then it becomes super vexed, right? Then the problem becomes even harder because the question is how do you define fairness, right? What is a fair hiring algorithm, right? And the problem, I'm not zooming into that, is also there are various measures of what fairness means in, 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 this, in this domain and you can't satisfy them all at the same time. Right? So this is basically a political issue. Another issue is opacity, a lack of transparency. This comes in two forms. One is the one that I mentioned is if you have proprietary software uh, and this is protected in order to protect trade secrets, you can't have access even if it were understandable, right? But in the context of especially deep learning, the, the, the processing and the analysis is so complex that you can't really tie, as we said before, the input to the output. Like even if you're an expert, you, you can't really understand how a certain system came to its conclusions, right? So there, there are different limits to why you cannot understand what a system is doing. There are related issues related to accountability, liability, and responsibility. Clearly, these are partly tied to a lack of transparency. If you can't justify why some decision was made in a certain way, how can you be accountable, right? But it's not only related to, um, to transparency, and there are also issues re with regards to safety, security, and reliability, right? If a system is unpredictable, how can you, um, can you make sure that it cannot be hampered with? So the problem is um, these are the issues we face in varying domains in different, in different, uh, in different software. And the question then is, OK, so you know, um, we are asked that we should trust AI. And there is the idea that, tr that, that AI should be built in a trustworthy manner. What do we do about this? Um, so trust in big data and AI is, is considered to be a desideratum. It seems like if you look into this U European Commission document, for instance, it says the following, right? Given the major impact that AI can have on our society and the need to build trust, um, it is vital that European AI is grounded in our values and fundamental rights, such as human dignity and privacy protection. Moreover, in addition to a lack of investment and skills, lack of trust is the main factor holding back the broader up uptake of AI. So there's a lot of you know, um, emphasis in these documents that we need trust in order to sort of like have a, um, well, 
if I would put it in a nutshell, it basically means we have a global competition, and if we want to you know, stay on this, on this global competition, we better have trust in AI, because otherwise uh, we don't have a single market and we don't get things done. I'm, I'm not doing justice to the whole document, right? But it was sort of like, it is clear that there is some rationale that we need to have trust because we want to have AI, and if we want to have AI, we need to have data, and that basically means we have people to give up their data to a certain degree. Um, I don't want to um, answer this question, but sort of like I want to pose for the end some, some conceptual and practical questions that we need to answer before we can even respond to this request for trust and trustworthiness. So let me first focus on the conceptual questions. First of all, um, can and should our reliance on AI be conceived of trust, right? I mean, it seems all of a sudden people think, seem to talk about trust when they talk about AI, and the question is why on earth? Right. I mean, why is trust like the notion that pops to people's mind when they think about a specific type of number crunching? Right. Usually, we don't capture this in, in, in terms of trust. The sub question is: Can we trust machines or only humans? Or what about socio-technical ecosystems? Do we need to? Do we? Should we understand? And I think partly this is the case to do justice to these uh, European Commission documents that they conceive um, AI systems as socio-technical systems and they, they seem to say we can talk about trust and trustworthiness only as far as there is a human in the loop. To what extent this is realistic, that's a different story, right? We can zoom into this, but this seems to be one answer. Mm -hmm. The question is also, can we actually talk about trust in case we have no choice? In philosophy, we would say if we are forced to do something, we don't talk about trust to begin with, right? And for instance, in, the, um, in Austria, there has been a case that uh, people who are unemployed are now being classified into two, three different categories. Um, um, and based upon these categories, they, they receive certain support and they don't receive cer certain support. This is not voluntary, right? Can we talk about trust to begin with if this is a forced upon uh, system? And what I also found quite striking when reading this white paper is there seems to be a very instrumental use of the notion of trust, right? It seems to be we need trust in order to, right? In order to have AI, in order to, um, I'm not saying these are illegitimate uh, grounds, right? For, for saying if we want to stay competitive, we need to have database systems, et cetera. I'm not, I'm not questioning this. I'm just wondering why we need to put this under the heading of trust. Um, second question, who should trust whom and what, right? Because if you think about trust, it's actually you have a truster and a trustee, and usually you trust in regards to something, and I'll get back to that in a second. But what on earth is this supposed to mean in the context of AI, right, trusting AI? And just to zoom in a little bit, I hope I'm still fine in time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what is that supposed to mean? Trust in data, trust in algorithms or platforms, right? As we have seen, you know, there, there are many instances where things can go wrong, either in the training data and the methods chosen, in, in should we trust the, the methods or results of data analytics, the applications for different purposes, should we, you know, is it the same if this is used in industry and in academia and governance or in the public sector? Um, should we trust individual or collective human or non-human actors, right? I mean, to what extent are we talking about sort of like artificial agents? I mean, that's the notion used. What, what, is, what is their relevance in these, in these trust issues? And keep in mind that, you know, what, what we had from, from Hardwick before, that this always has an epistemic and a moral component, right? We have the question of the competence and to what extent can people deliver what they're doing? To what extent does the software show where the limits are? You know, what the, what, to what extent is it, is it, for instance, showcased? We did this in order to make sure that the discrimination is minimized, something like this. And also, to what extent can I actually trust um, the actors in a moral sense if their business model is relying about uh, the exploitation of data, right? It's, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to make up straw man arguments. I'm just trying to question a little bit uh, the validity of some of these, these, uh, these claims. Um, if you look on top, right, trust and trustee, you know, somebody trusts somebody in regards to something, right? And um, the question is also, what are we supposed to entrust AI, right? Should we trust them for efficiency, efficiency or for taking care of our um, uh, civil liberties or whatnot? I mean, what is it actually that we're entrusting AI uh, to do here? Um, finally, for the, for the conceptual questions, what's the relationship between trust and trustworthiness, right? I mean, to be fair, in, in both this document by the European Commission and also in, the, in, the white paper, in, in this white paper, but also in the 
in the um, report from the high-level expert group, there's a lot of emphasis, emphasis on trustworthiness, and they are spelling out a lot of detail about what is meant by trustworthiness. I just want to, want to mention that this is, of course, the crucial question here. And again, you know, both notions have an epistemic and a moral dimension, right? a competence question and, a, and, a, um, uh, and an honesty or disinterested uh, question. Let me turn for the, for the last minute to the practical questions. And these are, of course, apart from the conceptual one, the hard ones that we need to work out. And I've been, um, as I said, um, part of the German Data Ethics Commission, which has delivered its report to the German uh, government last uh, October on regulation on AI and big data. And I'm just you know, paraphrasing some of the issues that, that need to be addressed uh, if you want to use AI and big data in, let's say in a trustworthy manner. It's not the notion that we used, but I'm adopting it here. So first of all, the question is how can we actually increase the trustworthiness of AI, right? This is what also this high level expert group is aiming and they give a lot of detail on how this can be done. And I'm just going to summarize some of them for you so that you get an idea. So one of them is explainable AI, right? Or, or transparency or accountability in machine learning. The question basically being is, if, we, uh, if we've seen that many of the, um, of the calculations are too complex to understand, can we work in, in research basically to, to move these boundaries of understanding how AI is making its decision, right? Can we have sort of like an explanation of how certain systems have come to their conclusion? And what you will find very often is that you have to strike a balance between explainability and, and, and accuracy in certain systems. So it doesn't come at no costs, if you wish, right? Um, then you have to come up with measures to assess and minimize bias and discrimination, right? We want to make sure that your, that your system is not systematically discriminating women. It doesn't help, it doesn't suffice to just drop the category gender uh, out of your database because um, your, your gender may be encoded through other types of data as well. Right. So it's not, you know, because data are being correlated, you being female may be correlated to other data and the data set just dropping uh, this, this one line within the database is not going to solve you, right? On the contrary, it may be better to have it in there because then you can at least test whether or not you're discriminating against women or not in your system, right? But this is all other than trivial and it, again, doesn't come at no cost. It's, it's extra effort to demonstrate that you're not discriminating in your database, right? Or in your, in your data sets. Um, Accountability and governance of socio-technical systems. This basically means, you know, what, what are the requirements for, for companies or for those using or applying or developing systems to make sure that they can check what, what is happening, what decisions are being made and how they can be, can be responding in, in case things go wrong. Um, this leads me to the point D, representation, participation and contestation. It's a bit bigger than it may seem on the, on the page. Because as I told you before, um, you know, if you want to avoid, let's say, discrimination and bias, right? And let's assume you're training a system on fa for facial recognition on predominantly male white faces, right? And you shouldn't be surprised that your system is not as good on female darker skinned faces, right? And there have been, there have been lots of demonstration that, that the accuracy differs really depending on what the data, training data was that you used to train your system, right? So you may say you want to make sure that in the data, different groups of people are being represented in the same way, right? On the other hand, you know, um, if you have a system such as the following, such as the one on recidivism, you have to at some point, uh, or let me step one, bit, one step back. What I told you before is even uh, minimizing discrimination is difficult, right? Deciding on what is fair and not fair may be even harder because this is a political issue. You can't delegate this to computer scientists and say, find your, find your definition of fairness, right? Because in the end, you will have to decide who gets to decide how a certain software is being built, right? And that is a political issue. Just, and, and that's what I meant by participation and contestation. It's not just that your data are being represented, but also discuss basically um, how things are being built and how they should be built, right? What should be tested? Who are those who are most affected, whose voice should be heard in, in deciding on how to build a, a certain system? And finally, not really finally, but also we need to processes and institutions of oversight, auditing, and control, right? Depending on what the system is, you may, and that's something we worked in, in the German Data Ethics Commission quite a bit on, is to, to distinguish between different levels of risks of different algorithmic systems, and depending on the level of risk to advise for different types of oversight, right? Um, up until the, 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 the banning of certain, uh, certain systems if they, uh, if they seem to interfere too strongly with our, um, with our you know, basic fundamental rights. 
And that's the last question I actually want to pose, right? Because there's a lot of work also right now on improving systems. And I find this is really, you know, on explainable AI, on fair, accountable, and transparent machine learning. But at some point, we also need to step one step back and basically ask, uh, should we object to trust and use AI or automated decision ma making, at least in certain sectors, altogether? Right? Instead of just optimizing how we should do it, at least there should be the possibility of saying, in certain areas, uh, we should not use it. But even if we do that, we need to justify and argue on what grounds we either argue for the usage of, uh, of, of AI or against it at certain domains. And I hope with that I was part of some time. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks a lot also for being a perfect time. And so we have 10 minutes for discussion. Question here? I'm not sure that it is working. I'm very I'd just like to have your own opinion on you mentioned the difference between relying on a system, for instance, and trusting it. But you didn't tell me your own opinion. So I'll tell you briefly my, my naive opinion on this. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that if you're talking about strong artificial intelligence, then there is indeed, you know, oops, I wouldn't I don't know, 100 years' time, if we haven't had some robots, the issue whether we can trust those robots is a relevant question. But if you're only focusing on weak AI, I don't see any difference between asking the question, can you trust that, and, and asking, can you trust um, your um, bread machine or your toaster? And I would say naively, no, of course I won't trust my toaster. I, I might trust the people who are making it to make a good product, and, and the toaster itself, I rely on it, but I've never trusted it. Yeah. I would actually agree to say if you if you talk about the technology proper, right, it, it's, it's a matter of reliance, right? But what I find interesting is if you think about these systems in which AI is embedded, they are usually socio-technical systems. And then it start, may start making sense about talking about trust in these distributed systems consisting of humans and technologies, right? Because very often action is distributed over sort of like machines and humans. And we want to capture this, then it may make sense to talk about trust again, especially if you talk about intentions and distributed, you know, to what extent. Because usually what you say is, let's say, um, there has been there is there is this this joke that that Immanuel Kant was a very regular person, right? So he walked the streets, you know, at the same time every day. So the neighbors used him as a clock, right? So whenever he passed by, it was eight o'clock in the morning. Right? So let's assume that at one day Kant was sick and he wouldn't pass by, and then people could not be annoyed at him, right? Because they merely relied upon him as a watch, but they don't, didn't trust him because he didn't even know that they were using them, him as a, as a watch as huge. So sometimes you can rely on people, because, you know, and then you can be disappointed that you missed your appointment with the doctors because he didn't pass by, but you can't really be annoyed about it, right? But the moment somebody lets you down intentionally or is maybe incompetent while portraying to be competent, then you can, you, you feel, you know, sort of like let down if, if, you, if you wish, and this is usually the point where people draw the line between, you know, disappointed reliance or being betrayed in your trust, and it's usually about you know, a relation of vulnerability towards others. And I think to a certain degree, we have a lot of vulnerability to many of these systems, right? So I think it's not completely overstretched to, 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 to cast these in terms of trust. But I think if we do it, we must be very careful to understand what we mean by that, right? And not to do it in a strategic manner. And my, and my impression is that sometimes it's done in a very strategic way, right? We want trust. There's a lot of emphasis also in politics and business that people should trust technology because whatever, right? Or um, that that you know that trust lowers transaction costs or whatever, but uh, I think it is possible to use it, but only in a socio-technical understanding and in a careful manner. And I hope this was. There was a question over there and another. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned about the capacity of machines or algorithms to, to discriminate or not yeah. discriminate well. I wonder if there are any empirical investigations in comparing certain algorithms capacity to, to, to fight, not to discriminate, and compare it to the human capacity yeah. to not to discriminate. Yeah. Because computers might be discriminating, but still discriminating less than a person who yeah. would be doing this sort of job. And th th there's, there's a lot of literature on that. And just let me, let me try to, to answer it, it briefly. So the problem is that very often, um, 
let's say, systems that have learned their, the way of, of discriminating from data usually are reproducing the stereotypes that exist in society. Let's assume you have a company that, um, that wants to uh, automate a process of hiring, right? And they have a history of, of hiring more men than women, right? Then, and, and also a history of promoting men better than women, right? And if you then, because in, if, if you design the system, you need to set, let's say, a target variable. You need to operationalize success, right? And if success is promotion, and if your system is already biased, then you're just reproducing the same stereotypes that you have in society. This is the problem with many of these systems, right? That you're just reproducing what is already happening. Now, this doesn't have to be the case, right? What you could do is instead is you could check this for discrimination and then design the system otherwise, right? Or also you could, there are lots of studies, I think also on, but don't nail me down on a specific one, but also on judges and to what extent, you know, their judgments either differs between people, some being more liberal, others being more strict. And also during the time of the day, right, being very harsh before the lunch break and then more relaxed afterwards. So there are tons of different biases which you can find, right? And now imagine there could be a wonderful system which basically gives feedback and say, oh, look, it's before lunch, you're being hungry. Does this affect your, your judgment, right? I mean, this would be, you know, I'm just making this up, but the, what you use these data that you have gathered for is up to you, right? And if you, if you use it in order to improve decision making, this is, this is, I think, a very good idea, and that's where it's very useful. The problem is only if you just uh, use what has been happened before through the data without this extra view on what is in the data and how can we possibly remedy for that, then you're running into trouble. But that is not an argument in principle against using database systems for decision making, but rather sort of like, you know, having a moment of care in how you design them. Right, and how you, what you use them for. There's another question over there. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I'm Rick Berger with the New City Philosophy. Okay. Um, so I'd like to come back to the difference between trust and reliance. And um, can I, first of all, this is just a small point about the two errors of trust that you listed. So I think I agree that both of them are errors, but I think the second error can, like, could be given broader scope. So I think you focused on is trusting most who are trustworthy, but if we accept that there's a difference between reliance and trust, I would say it's also an error if you not rely on those who are kind of trustworthy, or if you will only rely and don't trust those who are trustworthy. So you could phrase it in a broader way by saying kind of the error is that we do not trust those who are trustworthy, but just a small point. But I think because in the philosophical literature we already have a couple of ways for distinguishing trust from reliance, I was wondering if you would be willing to say a bit more on which of these views kind of you might favor. So it's kind of like trust and effective attitude, just trust and matter of commitment. You've got maybe have a couple of kind of views here. Do you kind of like think um, we should kind of explore all of those, or kind of can we build on the progress that has already made and kind of narrow yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. I, have a, I have a tendency of not citing there because I think people use trust in very different ways and also in the, in the very days we use it, sometimes we have a more epistemic connotation, sometimes it's more effective, right? It just, and what my, my take basically is um, how we fill this depends very specifically on the, on the trust relation we envisage, right? If I talk about trust in my parents and my partner, it's something very different from trust. We use the same term, right? Than using trust in my in my doctor or in in a lawyer or you know and depending on on uh, what is exactly I'm entrusting to who it may have more of an effective component in an epistemic I think it has both right I'm not siding with any of those who say it's either or I think this is uh, this is futile uh, right and I also think is uh, think I don't think this will be settled I have to say because if you take care to how people are using the notion of trust they use it for all these different ways of expressing this. So um, I know this is very often not satisfying, but it's just, um, um, I find this more and more, more adequate if I look at the ways, at the different ways people use the notion of trust. Um, in regards to the first point, I hope I got it correctly, but um, already the, the, um, the last point, right, um, that we also need to justify if we decide not to use certain systems, right? This, this, would, be, this would be the countering argument, to what extent can we, um, but I'm not sure I got the question right. Um, to what extent, we, we don't only need to justify if we don't use certain systems, but we also have to justify when we're not relying on certain systems if they would have been better, right? And there may be epistemic or moral grounds for not 
uh, for not using certain systems in a specific context. But I was clearly focusing, uh, you know, I, this was a bit of a, of a biased presentation for, first of all, um, showcasing the issues, the problems that we have, right? Because I think if they are not being resolved or at least attended to, right, then we shouldn't trust. Right? The moment we start doing this, we can start talking about trusting systems. Okay, I think we should stop here. Uh, thank you very much. To you.